Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is a pro-revenge story. Let me give you some background first. You've probably heard of families with a strict hierarchy where the oldest sibling calls all the shots. Well, my family was like that, except our parents were deadbeat drug addicts, so my oldest sister Tanya, 34 years old, let's call her the bossy one, was the one who raised all five of us kids. When Tanya said jump, everyone asked, how high? The main focus here is my youngest sister, Ava, 23 years old. Most of us have at least a few memories with our mom before she lost it, but not Ava. To her, the bossy one was the only mom she ever knew, and Tanya sure knew how to take advantage of that. As soon as we turned 18, the rest of us got out of our parents' place, except for Tanya. She waited until Ava and our brother were teenagers before moving across the country. Soon after, she found jobs and housing for all of us to move to the same state as her. Ava had begged for years to live with Tanya, but Tanya always said no, claiming someone had to take care of our dad and that she and her new husband needed space. That was until Tanya got pregnant. Then she had Ava move in to help out, and Ava had been there for two and a half years. Now the main story. Tanya's in-laws were coming to visit for a couple of weeks, so Ava had to stay with me during that time since they needed her room. Tanya didn't ask or let me know, she just dropped Ava off. One day, Ava saw me studying for my master's degree and said she had always wanted to go to college, too. This is how that conversation went. Me. So why don't you? Ava. Well, I talked to Tanya about it, but she said not everyone is cut out for college and that I wouldn't have time to work, study, and take care of my niece. Plus, it's expensive. Me. Lots of people work and study at the same time, and she could put your niece in daycare. I'm sure it wouldn't cost much more than what she's already paying you. Ava. She doesn't pay me. She just gives me food and a place to stay. If I need money, I pick up a shift at my job. That's when I realized my sister wasn't just babysitting. She was cleaning the whole house every day for free. She was only working eight hours a week at her regular job because she was too busy taking care of my niece. Long story short, it took weeks for me to convince her to apply to community college, and more weeks to actually get through the process. But she finally got accepted to start in September. All behind Tanya's back. Ava planned to tell everyone the next time we all got together for Independence Day, but before that could happen, Tanya called a family meeting at her place to announce she was pregnant again. Ava started crying because now she figured she wouldn't be allowed to go to college. Tanya got deeply hurt and offended that Ava had planned this behind her back. I spoke up. Our other siblings chimed in too. It was a whole mess. How could you do this to me? Who's going to take care of the babies? I can't believe you're being so selfish. If you like your sister so much, go live with her. Those were some of the things Tanya yelled. She kicked me and Ava out and Ava stayed with me until they patched things up. Our other siblings reached out later. One said I should have minded my own business. The other said she was on my side but wouldn't say anything to Tanya. After that, Ava moved back in with Tanya and didn't go to college. But they agreed Ava would get paid $6 an hour and be allowed to take more shifts at her job until the baby arrived. Then she could go to real college after the kid turned one. I know it was messed up, but they all, especially Ava, worshipped Tanya like a goddess. I waited a year before getting my revenge, making sure Ava had saved enough to live on her own. The Revenge First, I researched the legalities around paying someone with just food and housing. In the U.S., depending on the state, it's legal as long as you don't cross the line into them becoming an employee. For example, you can give them a task list, but you can't demand it gets done by a certain time. You can ask them to be somewhere, but not require a set schedule. It comes down to your choice of words. You also have to follow rental laws, like giving proper notice to a tenant. I had proof of the whole situation. Screenshots of Tanya admitting she didn't pay Ava, wouldn't let her move out or get another job, and kicked her out whenever she wanted. All this legal technicality seemed pointless since no one would actually sue Tanya. But that didn't matter to me. I just wanted to make sure her boss knew that if they were sued, it would be an open and shut case. Tanya worked for a civil rights law firm, so finding out she had an actual modern day slave at home would probably get her fired. I could have just sent an anonymous email with the proof to her boss, but then they'd explain why she was fired, and that could cause trouble for me and Ava. So instead, Tanya was always complaining about this woman Ashley at work who hated her guts and had tried to get her fired before. I went to the firm's website, found Ashley, luckily she was the only Ashley there, tracked down her Instagram and Facebook, and saw she had tagged her yoga studio in a post. 
I signed up for a membership at that studio. It took some trial and error to figure out exactly which class Ashley attended, but I finally nailed it down to Tuesday and Friday mornings at 8 a.m. For months, I went to those yoga classes, slowly becoming friends with Ashley. Around three months in, she asked to follow me on Instagram, but I was prepared. I had already deleted any pictures with Tanya in them. After about nine months, when our friendship was solid, I brought up the crazy coincidence that I knew Ashley worked with my sister Tanya. Before it could get awkward, I said, It's ironic that she works for civil rights, considering, you know, everything. That caught Ashley's attention. I told her the whole story, showed her all the screenshots. I could practically see the fire in her eyes. Apparently, her and Tanya had their own history of not getting along. That's not important here. Let's just say Tanya's a piece of work, and Ashley wanted payback just as much as me. I explained Ava's situation and why Tanya could never find out about this. That's why befriending Ashley was so key. If I had just anonymously sent the proof to the firm, they might have ignored it since firing Tanya over this could open them up to a lawsuit if it was mishandled. But with a friendly inside source providing the ammo, Ashley could make sure to handle it properly. I sent her all the files with her assurance that Tanya wouldn't hear about this directly, but she needed the proof to convince the other partner who had been protecting Tanya. Two months later, Tanya got fired for minor mistakes, lateness, and poor productivity. It was a small victory, sure, but I loved visiting her during the four months she was unemployed. She looked exhausted and miserable the whole time since she had no money for a sitter and Ava was away at college, so she actually had to take care of her own kids for once. The next one is an entitled people story. My family has owned this plot of land for over 50 years. My grandfather bought it back in the 60s and built up the farm from scratch. He passed it down to my father, who spent his whole life cultivating the land. When my dad got too old for the tough farm work, the duty fell on me to carry on the family legacy. Farming is in my blood. I know every inch of this land like the back of my hand. The soil, the trees, the rolling hills. They're a part of me. My family has poured their sweat and tears into this farm. We've weathered harsh winters, droughts, floods, you name it. But that's the life of a farmer. Persevering through adversity is part of the job. Our main crop has always been corn. Acres upon acres of sweet corn that we harvest each fall. The surplus gets sold to the local markets and grain elevator. It's honest, simple work. My grandpa used to say, If you take care of the land, the land will take care of you. I live by those words. Things were going just fine until about two years ago. That's when the new chief of police, Officer Williams, got appointed. Right from the start, I could tell this guy would be nothing but trouble. He started implementing all these new rules and regulations about farming practices and land usage permits. Total power trip, if you ask me. One morning in late April, I was doing my usual prep work for planting season. Tilling, fertilizing, checking the irrigation pipes. Suddenly a police cruiser comes barreling down my driveway, lights flashing. I was so startled I nearly dropped my shovel. Out stepped Chief Williams, chest all puffed out and a smug look on his face. Morning there, Charlie. Got a minute to talk? I reluctantly walked over, resting my shovel against the tractor. Something I can help you with, Chief. Well, you see, I've been reviewing land records for the county, and it seems you haven't updated your farming permit for this property in quite some time. I stared at him blankly. Farming permit? Since when do I need a permit for my own family's land? New regulations! All agricultural zoning needs proper documentation! He waved some paperwork in my face. And from what I see here, you're in violation of Code 64B, so I'm gonna have to shut down operations on this land until you get the right permits. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This arrogant fool was trying to stop me from working my family's land, the same land we had cultivated for generations without any issues. Now you listen here, I said, struggling to keep calm. My granddaddy bought this land in 1968. We've been farming here peacefully ever since. I got no idea what you're on about, but there ain't no way I'm stopping now. Chief Williams sneered. Well, I don't make the rules. I just enforce them. And unless you cooperate, I can cite you for obstructing justice. Might even have to arrest you. That was the last straw. I'd had it with this crooked cop abusing his power. I got right up in his face and looked him dead in the eyes. You listen to me! I built this farm with my own two hands just like my daddy and his daddy before. No uppity city boy like you has any right to tell me I can't work my own darn land. Now get back in your fancy cruiser and don't you dare set foot on my property again. Chief Williams was fuming. His face turned beet red. For a second, I thought he might actually hit me. But he just huffed angrily and said, You're making a big mistake, Charlie. This ain't over. Not by a long shot. He stormed off in a rage, kicking up dust as he peeled out down the road. 
I watched his car disappear, heart pounding with adrenaline. I knew this was just the beginning. Over the next few weeks, Chief Williams was relentless. He staked out my farm from dawn till dusk, waiting to catch me working. His officers would harass anyone coming down the road leading to my land. I even caught one of his rookies sneaking onto the property at night, presumably to snoop around for code violations. I refused to give in. Every day I tended the land just like I always had. I wasn't about to roll over for this crooked cop. But the final showdown came sooner than I expected. I was out fixing a damaged section of fence when Chief Williams came roaring up the road with two of his deputies. Before I could react, they tackled me to the ground and slapped handcuffs on me. You're under arrest for agricultural code violations, Chief Williams sneered as his flunkies hauled me up and shoved me into the back of the cruiser. And resisting an officer, you're gonna rot in a cell for this, Charlie. As we drove to the station, all I felt was rage. This was a gross abuse of power. I hadn't done anything unlawful. I was just a farmer tending to my own dang land like always. They booked me and threw me in a cell, but as I sat there, an idea came to me. I asked to make a phone call and got in touch with my buddy Jack who worked construction over in the next town. Hey Jack, I got myself in a pickle. That crooked Chief Williams arrested me on some bogus farming charge. Think you could spread the word around the county about what's going on? I gotta rally support to fight this. Jack was happy to put out the call. Within hours, word had spread all across the rural community about Chief Williams' shady tactics. Folks around these parts look out for their own, and they don't take kindly to outsiders pushing them around. By nightfall, there was already chatter at the local watering hole about townspeople coming together to protest my arrest. Chief Williams had kicked the hornet's nest, and he wasn't gonna know what hit him. At my arraignment the next day, over a hundred local farmers and townspeople showed up to rally outside the courthouse, waving signs saying, Drop the charges and Don't tread on our farms. Chief Williams looked nervous when he saw the crowd. The judge seemed sympathetic to my plight as well. She released me on bail and scheduled a court date to review my case. Word continued spreading and more folks came out each day to demonstrate against Chief Williams. They shut down Main Street with their tractors and pickups. The story even made the local paper. With the pressure mounting, Chief Williams became unhinged. He arrested anyone he could, even folks just passing through town. But it only made the community angrier. By the time my court date arrived, the farming permit law was the talk of the whole county. The courthouse gallery was packed. Everyone wanted to see the corrupt chief get his due. The prosecutor laid out the bogus charges against me. Then my lawyer presented deeds, land records, and character witness statements proving my family's generations of peaceful farming. The judge saw right through the smoke and mirrors. Not only did she dismiss the case against me, but she overturned Chief Williams' unlawful farming permit regulations entirely. The crowd erupted in cheers and applause. Chief Williams sat there, stewing in his defeat. He suddenly realized he had no friends left in this town. Word was he hightailed it out of there not long after. Last I heard, he took a job directing traffic in the next county over. Good riddance. As I walked out of that courtroom, the whole community welcomed me back as a hero. It was a landmark victory for the hard-working farmers in the area, and it sent a message that corrupt lawmen can't push us around. We'll fight for what's right. My granddaddy would be so proud if he could see how I upheld the integrity of our family farm. When oppressive forces try to tread on our livelihood, sometimes you just gotta take a stand. Like an old oak tree, sink your roots in deep and weather the storm. In the end, truth and justice will always prevail. The next one is a petty revenge story. So my kid brother got married 12 years ago this year. Being non-religious, they had their wedding and reception at a tithe barn in a country house. Thinking of something different for their wedding present, my dad decided that instead of getting several wedding cars for them, he would hire one car to take them from the venue to their hotel and as a surprise, hire a helicopter to take the bride and her dad from my parents' place where she was getting ready, her family is from down south, to the venue. Then after the ceremony, the newlyweds, her immediate family, and ours would each get a 10-minute flight. So we, I, set out looking for a helicopter hire. We found this one company. They surveyed my parents' place to make sure they could get in and out. We have a six-acre field adjoining their garden, our driveway, and did the same at the venue, confirmed all was okay, and my dad signed the contract and paid the 50% deposit. Three weeks before the wedding, they called back and decided that they could not actually get the helicopter into either the venue or our field and would be canceling the hire and would be refunding the deposit when they did their next invoice pay run at the end of the month. Cue my old man losing his temper and by the end of the day getting his money back. What followed was a mad scramble to find another helicopter firm, which in rural Lancashire are not exactly found on every street corner. 
After a fraught couple of days, we found another firm who were more than happy with getting in and out at both places, were cheaper and more relaxed than the initial firm. When we told them why we were booking it last minute, they told us that we were not the first that they had heard of being let down by that firm. Here is where the petty and honestly unintentional revenge comes in. Back then, I was a frequent contributor to a car forum I will call Mark's Car Nerd Forum, which is how my wife referred to it. It was not a massive one. At most, I think we had about 70 members, but it was ours. One guy sorted out setup, and we each contributed five pounds a year to admin it. There were half a dozen subforums where we would chat about motor shows, new car launches, F1, etc., and one invite-only VIP area. Anyway, out of frustration, I posted on the open pages about how angry and stressed we had been over the whole thing with a post titled, Beelzebub's Helitours are a bunch of absolute idiot. Nothing I wrote was untrue. I just laid out the facts of what they did and the stress it put us through a couple of weeks before the wedding. Of course, the guys all chimed in in support of how poorly we had been treated until someone pointed out that we, as a forum, had paid for a Google ranking boost and that if someone searched for a particular thing, say, Lamborghini Gallardo, then our forum would be on Google page one because one of us had posted about it. So everyone changed their post to start with a version of, what's that? Beelzebub's Helitours are a bunch of absolute idiot? Within a day, if you searched Beelzebub's Helitours on Google, one of the top results on page one was a link titled, Beelzebub's Helitours are a bunch of absolute idiot. Eventually, one of the directors of said firm emailed the forum admin, demanding the post be removed as it was damaging his firm's reputation. Dave the admin told him that unless he could provide irrefutable proof that my version of events was in any way incorrect, then the post would be staying up. This was followed by various threats of legal action to which Dave responded by locking the post with the message, Beelzebub's Helitours have threatened to sue Mark's car nerd forum to remove this post. We have repeatedly asked them to provide evidence that this version of events is in any way untrue which they have failed to do so. Until such time that they do, this post will remain up as a true account of how our member was treated by them. The next one is a malicious compliance story. I'm finally leaving my toxic job for a better opportunity. My narcissistic boss treats everyone under her like crap and is generally rude, condescending, and miserable to work for. We work in a field where we are constantly bombarded by salespeople, many of whom are extremely persistent and borderline rude. I sometimes get over 100 emails a day from such salespeople, not to mention phone calls, but I have specific rules set up in my Outlook so that they mostly go straight to my junk folder. My boss is not so good at Outlook or technology in general, so she does not know how to do this. She would often scream at me to find emails for her because somehow she could not even figure out how the search function worked. When I resigned, she told me to notify every representative I am regularly in contact with that I am leaving and that she is the new point of contact until they find a replacement for me. I've spent the last week providing each and every salesperson with her email and direct dial. Good luck getting rid of those. The next one is an entitled people story. Years ago, my dad met Harold through mutual friends and they hit it off. I was 18 and in college when I met him, and we never had a close relationship. However, he always seemed to think of himself as a family friend, and was extremely infantilizing and condescending towards me. Every time I saw him, I'd try to tell myself it wasn't that bad, only for him to prove me wrong less than a minute later. Harold would disrespect my boundaries, say things like, You're not 19, you're a baby, while I was talking to other people and patronize me, my education, or my hobbies whenever he had the chance. He always noticed that annoyed me, to which he'd playfully ask if I hated him. I always said no, but only for my father's sake. The final straw came the day Harold interrupted a barbecue to say, I really like you, even though you're an impolite brat. I was 20 years old. I'd been quiet all day working on a paper during the barbecue, but replied patiently and politely whenever anyone addressed me. And even if that hadn't been the case, I knew he didn't have the right to talk to me like that. After that, I started making an effort to avoid any events I knew he'd be attending. Yesterday was my father's girlfriend's birthday. They threw a small lunch party at my dad's apartment. I went there with my fiancé and our six-month-old son. Harold was there. I hadn't seen him in months, but he still talked to me as if I was a dumb child. Never mind that I'm engaged, a mother, and 26 years old. I spent the whole party ignoring his helpful advice about me being too young to get married or be a mom. It helped that most of the other guests seemed to disagree with him. My baby spent most of the afternoon sleeping. There's a bassinet in my old room. He woke up hungry, so I went to breastfeed him and excused myself from the party for a while. I got back to jokes and comments, all from Harold, about how I was probably struggling if my son was managing to leech me away for so long. 
He went on to interrupt a conversation I was having with another of my dad's friends to question pretty much everything about my parenting. He doesn't even have custody of his daughter, by the way, and to make more comments about my age. I decided I couldn't take it anymore after he asked if I'd thought about giving my baby up for adoption. I got my son and told my fiancé we were leaving. We said goodbye to everyone except Harold. When we got to the door, Harold came to ask why we were leaving. I tried to make up an excuse, but he kept trying to make us stay. After a small back and forth, he jokingly asked if I hated him, and this time I said, Yes, I do. Can we go now? He didn't say anything, and we left. On the way home, my fiancé said he was proud of me. My father called this morning to say the opposite, and we had a small fight, but ultimately decided to drop the subject. I'm sure this isn't over, but if it keeps going, it won't be because of me. This is far from my proudest moment, and a small part of me regrets it, but I'm done. The next one is an entitled people story. When I went off to college, my freshman year roommate was that guy everyone tells horror stories about. This story took place after I'd already put up with a lot of misery from him, but before he'd really pissed me off. Just to be fair to everyone, this was quite a while ago. I'm not going to give it an exact date, but here are the say how old you are without saying how old you are clues. AOL was carpet bombing everyone's mail with CD-ROMs trying to get you to use their services. Digital cameras existed, but even the cheapest ones were expensive, and we were all some shade of poor college student, so we were using film cameras, usually of the disposable variety. This will be relevant later. Anyhow, I was in a double occupancy room on a floor with about 16 such rooms. Other than my roommate and one or two others, the other 35-ish people on my floor of our dorm were great. People were friendly, planned social events, large and small together, and were generally pleasant to be around. Rumi, as he shall henceforth be known, wanted to be the bad boy. He was obsessed with the movie Fight Club. He started a fight club. He drank, underage, and smoked, so gross, in our room. He played loud music in the room while I was sleeping. He'd steal stuff from others and was just generally an annoyance for the rest of us. Anyhow, after returning from a trip, I had left a disposable camera with a couple of shots left sitting on my desk, wound and ready to take a picture at a moment's notice. When I came back from classes that day, I was putting it away and realized that it was no longer wound. Someone had taken a picture. Rumi and I had some history by now, so I instantly knew what had happened. Whatever, I used the last picture or two, then took it in to get it developed. If you are reading this and expecting pictures of anything other than Rumi's ass, I have a few somewhat contradictory thoughts for you. You are a sweet, sweet summer child. Just so you know, I'm talking about Rumi's bottom, not his donkey. Don't change. If it's not already too late, you should get off the internet and enjoy the last gasps of your innocence before you realize that this is about as benign as you're going to find here. It only took a decade or so to be able to laugh about all my trouble with Rumi. Learning to live away from home is a great experience. Sorry, back to the story now. I was a little irritated because at this time you paid per picture developed, and so I'd managed to exchange actual cash money for two pictures of Rumi with his ass hanging out along with the rest of the pictures on that roll of film. So, there I was, sitting at my desk thinking about revenge, and about half a second of thought let me hit upon the obvious, perfect, glorious solution. Every floor on our dorm, which was quite large, had a bulletin board that was literally the first thing you'd see when getting off the elevators at our floor. Each floor could decide how they wanted to decorate their own board. Some floors had boring stuff like announcements, some had paintings, but we had decided that we were going to post pictures of us doing fun things. Anyhow, these four feet by eight foot boards were entirely covered with an ever-changing photo collage. Rumi was way too cool to pay any attention to this or contribute in any way, so I just worked both copies of his moonshot into the collage. It was perfect. It was just a sea of faces, so one more pasty oval didn't stand out in the least. The best part was that Rumi was clearly identifiable in the picture. The rest of the people on my floor noticed pretty much instantly. Decades later, I can perfectly recall one of my floor mates grinning and saying, that's a lot of skin, every time I think of this story. Within a day or two, everyone on the floor, including our RA, were laughing about it. We all were just waiting to see how long it would last. But Rumi's bridges had all been long burned at this point, so there wasn't really anyone that was going to tell him about it. It was weeks before he found out. He continued to be the bane of my existence, but those are stories for another day, and he never messed with my cameras again. Epilogue, I don't think I ever spoke to or laid eyes on Rumi in person after that year, but every five or ten years I go trolling through the interwebs to see if I can find him. 
For a while, I was expecting to find him in court records. To his credit, he appears to have settled down, has a good job, and a family. So, Rumi, if you're reading this, nice job turning things around. Good luck. The last story is titled, My Father Sued My Sister for My Mother's House. A bit of backstory, my parents got divorced 33 years ago. Oh, and at the time, they both owned several houses. When they separated their assets, my mother got the home she lives in now, and my father got the home he lives in now, but he tried to still take the home she lives in by not paying the mortgage payments and not telling her he hadn't paid the mortgage. Had it not been for my godfather loaning my mom the money to get the payments up to date, my father would have put my mother and his three kids out on the street. Fast forward 28 years later. My father owned his own business, and he was looking for someone to buy it, and so my sister offered to buy it from him. They agreed on price and signed the contract. Now here's the rub. The business was a business that was losing customers because it's a dying industry, and my father never told my sister that. My sister is one of the hardest workers I know, and she put everything she had into the business, and nothing she was doing was working. And that wasn't because she wasn't doing the right thing, it was because the business in and of itself was a dying medium for that industry. During all this, after my father had finally retired, they got into an argument about a financial matter in dealing with the company, and my father was completely disrespectful in the way he handled it towards my sister, and he did that in front of her employees. My sister stopped talking to him at that point. Over the next couple of months, despite my sister's extensive hard work, the company went under, and my sister had to close the business after it had been open for 38 years. My sister was devastated by this because not only did she put all her hard work, her blood, sweat, and tears into it, but she also put all her financial resources, which meant that she was financially devastated as well. My father was really upset because the company that he had created and nurtured over 38 years had been closed through what he saw as no fault of his own. Clearly, because the business closed, my sister could not continue to pay my dad's payments she was paying him for his business. Then she found out that the business had already been dying. In fact, my father had taken money out of his own account to put into the business because he knew it was dying when he sold it to her. He literally scammed his own daughter in the sale, for lack of a better way of saying it. Because she stopped paying him, he decided that he was going to sue her in court with a judge and everything. Now for context, a few years before all of this happened, my mom had gotten sick and gone to the hospital, and at the time I lived across the country and my brother lived across the country, and the only one who lived in the same state was my sister. My mother was afraid that if something happened to her, we wouldn't get the house, so she put the house in my sister's name since my sister lived the closest. Oh, the house was still in my mother's name as well, but my sister's name was added to it. After my mom got out of the hospital, she never got around to changing it. So, when my father started threatening to sue, my sister went through her assets and realized that my mother's house was still in her name and switched it back over to just my mother's name. In our state, however, we have a law that if you think someone fraudulently switches an asset out of their name in order to avoid being sued for it, you can sue them for that asset still, and it's up to them to prove that it wasn't fraudulently transferred. So, when my father decided to sue my sister, he added my mother's house onto the lawsuit as one of the things he wanted. He didn't sue my sister for the house that she owns in her name with her husband in a whole nother city. He sued her for a house she hasn't lived in in over 25 years, and a house that she has not put any money into ever in her life. Now, when he first filed the suit, I thought he was just trying to force my sister to talk to him because I couldn't imagine any parent, let alone my parents, suing their child, but he went through with it. He initially told me that he was suing for my mother's house because the lawyer told him he had to sue for all her assets, and since my mother's house had been in her name, he had to sue for that as well as her house. But then I found out he wasn't suing her for her house, he was suing her only for my mother's house. He's still mad that he didn't get my mother's house 33 years ago when they got a divorce. So mad that he lost in that case that he decided to go after her house the first chance he got. And this was it 33 years later. The even more messed up thing is that when I found out he was going after my mother's house, I myself told him, if you go through with this lawsuit and you win my mother's house and you take her house away from her, I will never forgive you. I will never talk to you again. You will lose me and losing me will also mean you lose your grandchild, your only grandchild. So you need to think about whether or not this is worth it to you. And he still went through with it. He still went through with it knowing that he would not only lose my sister, but me as well. 
He filed this lawsuit five years ago, and they just got through going to court. So for the last five years, he's forced his daughter, his princess, his baby girl to suffer under the weight of knowing that her father, A, screwed her over, B, was putting money before her, and C, apparently felt no real remorse or sadness to hurting his own child emotionally, mentally, and financially. The worst part is, he didn't just teach her that, he taught all three of his kids with this one act. He did all of this because he thinks that even though he got everything in the divorce, with the exception of primary custody of us kids and that one house, that he is entitled to take my mom's house after 33 years of her living there, putting all of her time and energy into making it at home for us kids, and putting her own money into improving it, and her paying off the mortgage on her own as a single mother while raising three teenage children on what would be considered poverty wages today. We grew up in the late 80s and early 90s. He hasn't put a dime into that property since 1988, and yet he somehow feels like he's entitled to take it away from my mother without even caring about the damage it would do to his own children. And you know how some people have some idea in their head that it's okay to mistreat your kid if they're not your biological kids, like a stepchild or foster child or an adoptive child? Which I think is disgusting in its own right, but there are people out there who actually believe that, so for those out there who actually believe that it's okay to mistreat your child if they're not your biological child, I say this. It's not like we're like his stepchildren or foster children or children he adopted or any other random crazy ass excuse that some random person tries to use to justify their own abuse of their children. We're his biological flesh and blood, and there's no denying it because we look very similar to him and his family. I just can't stop thinking what kind of sick duck sues their own kid. Update, I commented on this down below, but I thought I'd add this update for those who asked. A lot of people here have said that my sister needed to do her due diligence in examining the business. My sister did examine all the business records for the last 10 years, and she had a lawyer go over the contract with a fine-tooth comb. It wasn't a matter of her not doing her due diligence. It was a matter of the business records that she was given were very different from the business records that held the actual information necessary. For lack of a better way to say it, he cooked the books. And for those wondering the outcome, she did file a countersuit for him selling her a business that was unviable. She was able to prove in court that the business was failing before he sold it to her, and that the equipment he sold her was equipment that he had bought 20 years ago and was no longer usable when it came to the technology of today. Also, I was already pretty sure that no jury worth their salt would give him a house that my sister never put a dime in and hadn't lived in for over 25 years, especially when he wasn't going after any of her other assets. I was right. When they got to court, my sister told the judge and the jury that she didn't want anything from him in her countersuit. She didn't want money, she didn't want anything from him but for this to be over. He told the court and the jury, but he just wanted my mother's house in lieu of the $300,000 my sister owed him for the business. My father lost his lawsuit. My sister won her lawsuit and was given zero dollars, as that's what she was asking for. So, he permanently lost one daughter, and the other one, myself, is seriously questioning whether I want to talk to him ever again. Over the last 10 years, I've maintained a relationship with my father, not because it's what he wanted, but because it's what I wanted. Now I just don't know if that's something I want anymore. I don't know if I want to be around the kind of person that could sue his own child. Update 2. First, I want to thank everybody for their comments and their concerns, regardless of whether I agreed with them. You take time out of your day to give me your opinion, and that is truly appreciated. For those who were wondering, I did try to have a relationship with my father to some extent again after telling him exactly how I felt about what he did and making it clear to him that those were my feelings, and they weren't going to change. Unfortunately, my father is my father, and I ended up not being able to put aside what he had done from who he is, because at the end of the day, what he had done is directly a result of who he is. So, I've stopped talking to him for the time being. Ironically, the thing that got me there was an argument over lettuce. Basically, he wanted to give me lettuce that I would never use, and I repeatedly told him I would never use it, but he kept insisting that I come over and get it. But at the end of the day, I basically realized that, at my emotional state right now, even if I wanted to have a relationship with him, I can't because I'm too angry, hurt, and disgusted by what he did. I'm a person who used to believe that family was everything, and I don't anymore because of his actions, and that is devastating to me. So I just believe that right now, I'm better off not talking to him. I want to thank you again for your kind words and your caring concern. The next one is an entitled people story. After reading a lot of these, it finally occurred to me that I have one to share. 
Ten-ish years ago, when I, 25M, was still in high school, I was part of a youth development organization. In some of our weekend camps in conjunction with other units, I had developed one hell of a crush on a girl a year younger than me from the neighboring unit. Call her Crush. Of course, I wasn't the only one, and while I made my move and made good progress with her over the following months, I wasn't the lucky one in the end. My competition, call him Jake, was from Crush's unit, so he had the advantage of having more regular in-person contact with her. They were together a couple of weeks until Crush decided that Jake wasn't the right fit for her, and split with him. As much as I was sympathetic to her for the breakup, I took this as the perfect opportunity to make my move. Think of me what you will for that, I was young and dumb and took my chance. It worked, and less than two weeks later, we were together, and not being shameful about it. Cue Jake, setting in motion actions to trigger my revenge. The youth organization held yearly camps where other teens from units all over the country would get to meet in a central location for a whole week, conducting activities to build skills, teamwork, and inter-unit relations. One of these camps happened a week after Crush and I got together, and of course, we signed up for all the same classes together. So did Jake, and this exposed him to how much better as a couple Crush and I were compared to Crush and Jake. Apparently, he didn't like that one bit, and on the final night of the week-long camp, which was a party night, he went spreading rumors about how I had been talking crap behind Crush's back, that I was calling her ugly, had said I was being with her out of pity, had forwarded intimate photos of her, of which she never sent me in the first place, hold that thought for later. Generally, really hateful rumor-mongering. Crush, of course, heard these rumors herself and came to me crying called me all sorts of names, and left with her friends all giving me dirty looks. Being a young, dumb teen at the time, I had no idea what was going on, and didn't suspect foul play, as at the time Jake and I were good mates. A day later, on the ride back home, I tried to message her to discuss the previous night, accusations flew, we had a big fight, and I ended the conversation angrily, saying I was fine with never seeing her again. Told her to enjoy her life without me. Think of me what you will for that. Q, Crush and I finding out we had been played. Later that day, the guilt for being an a-hole to her set in, and I messaged her again apologizing for my words and not being supportive enough when she came to me crying, explaining that I had no idea what was going on or what I had done to trigger her being upset with me. She then finally comes out and tells me that she had heard from multiple people the rumors against me. Now I finally had an idea of what had happened the previous night, I told her how much she meant to me and that I would never do anything to compromise our relationship. We then started contacting the rumor spreaders together, putting together the pieces, and all accounts led back to one person. Jake. The revenge came during the fact-finding. As Crush and I were going back through everyone who had spread the rumors, we were showing them our case against him and tearing down every friendship that Jake had throughout the organization. Some people, of course, stayed on his side. We simply blocked them. But most people saw Jake for the person he truly was, a jealous a-hole who would see others in ruin for his own gain. He lost almost all his friends in the organization, and everyone shunned him. He ended up leaving the organization not long after. The next story is titled, Entitled Neighbors Call 911 on Me When I Kick Them Out of My Pool. Claims I Trespassed on My Own Property. Property seems like a strange concept to many people, but sometimes stranger than I ever thought. The story I'm about to tell you proves exactly that. But let's start with the basics about my family. My father was well off, so we lived in a pretty nice neighborhood. He did a lot of investing, and that's mainly what paid for our house. I do not consider myself to be a materialistic person, but I have to admit that nice things can sometimes make you feel good. Our beautiful big house gives me a good start every day, and the big pool makes me even happier, especially on hot days. Now, we're a Hispanic family, and when we bought this house, there was a pretty low Hispanic population in the city. Because of this, there were some times where we got treated differently than everyone else. We did have some genuinely nice neighbors, but there were also several neighbors who were snobby, entitled, and racist. I remember when we first moved in, the lady across the street even made a remark about how can a family like them afford to live here? We did our best to brush them off most of the time, but still, it can be pretty annoying. We are hard-working people, just like everyone else. Most times, people like us, minorities in places like these, have to work even more to afford something someone that fits into the norms could easily do. Anyway, the house sat vacant for a while before we bought it. 
I think like a year. Like I said, it was a pretty upscale neighborhood to live in, so I'm assuming that it was out of most people's price range. At the time this happened, I was only 19 and in university. I didn't have a car at that moment, so sometimes after school my dad would still pick me up and I would head home. I was pretty close with my entire immediate family, so a lot of times we would grill outside and hang out by the pool for hours. This one particular day, which was the plan, my sister was even leaving work early to come over. My dad and I were pulling into the driveway and we heard a lot of noise coming from the backyard. We got out of the car and directly went after the noise. Our pool was full of people. Strangers, drinking, dancing, and having fun in our yard. I see the anger building up in my father's eyes as he takes a few steps closer to the pool. What are you all doing here? My father shouted. Having fun, but who are you? I have been having parties here every year, one man replied. I have to ask you to get out, as this is my property now, my dad said, angrily. The guy, and who I am assuming is his girlfriend, then gets out of the pool but starts yelling racial slurs at my father and me, saying that we need to go back to Mexico and that there's no way we actually live in this neighborhood. He even told me I looked like a pool cleaning boy. Of course, this really upsets me, and I think my dad would have probably started a physical fight, but the guy and his girlfriend were already taking off. All the other people in the pool just got out and walked out, passing by my father and I without saying a single word. We actually called 911 on the neighbors and tried to get them for trespassing, but unfortunately our security cameras couldn't prove that it was them, so they basically got away with a slap on the wrist and verbal warning from the police. Either way, my dad stepped up security measures after that on the house. My dad even got new locks for our gate, several more security cameras that would send notifications to our phones if it detected motion. Like I said, we thought that was the end of the weird interaction, and we wouldn't be seeing those people anymore anytime soon. Everything was pretty quiet for a while as well after that. The security cameras didn't catch anything, our house alarm never went off, everything seemed peaceful and quiet. After a few other days, we left to visit my mother's parents. It was a trip that was organized a few months before, and we were all excited to go. We even forgot about the pool events and left without a worry. We arrived at my grandparents and started talking and eating, because my grandma prepared an amazing meal for all of us. And as we were eating, the alarms on our phones started going off. My dad pulled out his phone and smiled. It's them again, in the pool, he said. I have an idea, Dad, I said. So, let me tell you the idea I had. I called the police, giving them an anonymous tip. I pretended to be an alarmed neighbor, taking care of my neighbor's property. I know for a fact that the owners are not home for a few days, and I saw people entering their yard, I said on the phone. Maybe they allowed someone to stay as they're not home, replied the policeman. I don't know about that. They also had problems with these people before as they trespass on their property once again, I said. We'll check, the policeman replied. I ended the phone call, we jumped into our car, and drove home. We arrived at the gate at the same time as the police, which says a lot about them. The people at the pool heard the cars, so some of them came at the gate, and one of them was that boy. Officer, I'm so glad that you're here. This family keeps trespassing on my property, he said. I understand that they're probably very poor, but it's not okay, he added. We actually came here because we got a phone call from a neighbor, the policeman replied. You are the owners, right? said the policeman, looking at us. Yes, for a while now. These people keep trespassing like it's an empty space. I live here, my family lives here, and I want safety for us. You have to do something about it, my dad answered. Officer, he's lying. Look at him, the man said, mocking us by doing different sounds and gestures. This problem is actually very easy to solve, said the policeman. Let me see the property documents, he added. My dad entered the yard, opened the front door, went inside, and brought the documents. The policeman nodded and looked at the man. Now you, sir, the policeman said. What? What documents? You have to believe me. Look at me and look at them, the man shouted. Sir, race is not a ticket. It does not equal documents, and it doesn't, or let's say shouldn't, give you any preferential treatments, said the policeman. You're under arrest, he added. The man was handcuffed, and everyone that was with him at the pool had to go to the police station. It felt amazing to feel like justice was made for us. And we finally got to enjoy our house and pool without someone trespassing. Summary. In a racist neighborhood, some people decide that it's okay to trespass onto our property and use our pool. After my father kicked them out, they entered again when we were on vacation. 
We called the police and gave them an anonymous tip and went back home. The prime crook was arrested and everyone else was taken to the police station. We got our pool back and justice was served. The next story is titled, Don't Use My Laundry Detergent. I used to live in dorms where there was communal laundry, and I was usually good at remembering to bring my detergent back with me. Well, I forgot one day and left my detergent in my laundry bag on top of the washer I was using. I come back to find my once half-full detergent almost gone. I was pissed because I was 18 with not a lot of money and detergent is expensive, but I was willing to waste some to get sweet revenge. A week later, it was time to do laundry. I poured bleach into the bottle with the little detergent left and forgot it. I purposely put it inside my laundry bag on top of the machine I was using to make it known that obviously it was someone's and not for communal use. Well, I come back to find my detergent almost gone. So to the person who used my detergent, I hope you were washing your whites. The last story is titled, My Neighbor Made My Life a Living Hell. When I first moved into my current apartment about a year and a half ago, things were seemingly fine. It's in a condo unit, but its own separate building, so it's just my unit in the building and one neighbor across from me. When I first arrived, my neighbor introduced himself and asked if I needed any help carrying things in. I told him I'm all set, he seemed relatively friendly. Over the course of several months, however, I started to get the inkling that things were not fine with him. I would hear strange yelling coming from his apartment from him or other people. People would be coming at all hours. He would be going in and out of the apartment briefly for only five minutes at a time. I was very quickly starting to pick up on the notion that he was selling, and not just minor stuff, I believe, if you catch my drift, out of the unit. The night before Easter, my car was robbed. I called the police on Easter Day, and they came out, but couldn't do too much about it. I reported it to my landlord and the woman who was associated with my building, who originally showed me the apartment. She accidentally texted me, thinking that she was texting my landlord, expressing that it was definitely my neighbor who did it. I texted her back and kind of questioned it and asked if she thought it was him. She said that she doesn't have proof. Fast forward to a month later, the police come one night to my unit, and I'm hearing in the hallway my neighbor being handcuffed. He essentially gets accused of some serious things involving a firearm. At this point, I'm completely freaked out. I had been trying already to look at other apartments, but it had been very difficult to find anything reasonably priced and a good unit. Over the next month or so, I started smelling an insane amount of smoke on a daily basis. The amount of cigarette smoke that was hoarding into my unit was unbearable. I ended up confronting my neighbor and telling him that the amount of smoke is really bothering me and that I have asthma. Lie, but felt necessary. He's very apologetic and says it will not happen again. Of course, it continues to happen. At this point, I had just about had it. Between the strange yelling happening, his criminal activity, the smoke, I couldn't take it. It might sound cheesy, but my one guilty pleasure TV show is Real Housewives, which I can guarantee is not his. I set up my Bluetooth to connect to my audio of the show through my phone. I placed the Bluetooth right near my door. I blasted Real Housewives like it was no one's ducking business. Our walls are so thin that he and his clientele had to listen to nearly every episode of Housewives of Jersey on a loop. When I would hear him having conversations or people coming over, I would start playing it loudly through the door. I know it's not the pettiest possible route I could have gone, but I damn well tried. To conclude the story, several months ago I come home one night to police at my apartment. They're looking for my neighbor and doing a wellness check on him. They end up barging down his door, and long story short, he was deceased. I figured it was OD related, but the night before it happened, I did hear a very intense argument with him and someone else. I'll probably never fully know. The next one is an entitled people story. I had a guy friend. Our friendship lasted four years, and he was also my group mate in a big project. Our teacher asked us to work together, and so we planned on working at his apartment because he doesn't want to do it at my house. When his mother used to live with him, his apartment was clean, tidy, and it smelled good. Not until his mother decided to buy a new house. However, he didn't come with her because he wanted to be alone with a cat. Of course, his mom agreed because she loves to spoil him. After two years of being locked up due to the pandemic, I finally got to see his apartment, where I used to work with assignments and study with him. At first, it was clean. He was embarrassed of having a dirty apartment. Not until my fourth visit came, where our school project was due next month. 
The moment I opened the door, it smells full of his cat's crap. And his entire apartment was full of trash, clothes, with cat poop, and the litter's dirt is everywhere. I didn't bother saying anything to him because I thought he was depressed. Two days after that, his apartment is still like garbage. I told him that I couldn't take it anymore and that animal feces is dangerous to both his health and the cat. He then replied, oh, I thought you wouldn't mind because you didn't judge me before for having a messy room. And I told him, yes, indeed, I didn't because I was thinking he might be depressed. But he got mad and started raising his voice. Why don't you clean it? Let's just be fair. It's like you're almost living here since you visit too often. Why don't you do it and I will work half the project? I was offended, but I didn't mind at all because he might be having a hard time. So I started to help him by cleaning his apartment. I was worried about both him and his cat's health and most importantly, his mental health. I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety, so I know the feeling of it. It sucks. Not until the due date of the project is next week. Every visit, his house is like that, full of animal feces, unwashed dishes, clothes, trash, everywhere on the floor, and I would clean after his mess. On my third and fourth clean, every time I asked him to show me his work for our project, he would only respond with, I'll only show you if you're finished. And I would start doubting since I didn't see him working on it, and would just play online games. During lunch at that time, we were supposed to have our lunch together, but he didn't like the neighbor's food and threw it out of anger at the neighbor's door. The neighbor was hired by his mom to cook for him, since he doesn't know how to cook that much and would just order some food online which is unhealthy. And I get what his mom is feeling. I got mad, lol, and I was so done, and I told him to give me his work for our project. And when the MF handed his work, you can literally see he just copy and pasted it from the internet. It didn't make that much effort. I was mad, but I stayed calm and just walked the duck out of his apartment. I don't know if this is what you would call revenge, but he needed to pull himself together. So I contacted my best friend, which was his crush, and started to ask for help regarding our project. Then she asked where to meet. I waited for three days and finally asked her to meet me at the address I gave her. <laughs> she was his weakness. We knocked, he opened the door, and he panicked, lol. He was about to ask us to wait outside, but it was too late. Well, he didn't have a choice. Ha <laughs> ha, he let us in, and his apartment didn't change at all. He was so embarrassed that he started cleaning and helping us with the project. Being friends with my best friend for years, I can literally say what she's thinking as if we're talking telepathy. I know my best friend damn well, and this is a complete turnoff for her. I already warned her about him because he's a big red flag. I don't want to talk everything about him, but he's definitely a big red flag. Well, if he'd change for the better, then I might help him again. But he doesn't listen at all. After that, he asked his mom to hire a maid. I was relieved because I'm able to work with our school project without a worry. But ah, he's such a jerk. MF started yelling here and there at the maid for only a small mistake. I didn't want to get involved. Not until he personally talked bad about her, cursing, wishing her to be jobless. That's where I joined in and confronted him. I went home and called my best friend again. After bringing my best friend to his apartment, he was so nice to his maid. He wasn't a brat. I laughed and he asked why, and I sarcastically answered him, What did you eat? that you stopped yelling at your maid. I can hear the maid laughing while washing the dishes. He got mad, and then he felt embarrassed. My best friend understood what I was talking about and stared at him for a very long time. When I got home, he started texting me, cursing me to die, and asked me not to come to his apartment anymore because my best friend confronted and blocked him and blaming me that I ruined his love life. Hell yeah, I agreed. I've had enough of him anyway. We did good at our school project. Well, thanks to my best friend's presence. Ha ha ha, LOL. If it wasn't for her, he's doomed. After the project, he asked our teachers to swap partners. And now I don't have any issues or problem with my new partner at all. Good luck to your new partner anyway. The next story is titled, So I've been scrolling through this sub for quite a time, wondering if any of the stories here are true. And then today happened. First, I drive a red 2005 BMW 3 Series. 
Nothing too fancy, but I really like my car and I'm kind of proud of it because I'm only 22, looking a lot younger, relevant for the story, and bought it with my own money. Why do I tell you that? Well, flexing, of course. And it's the central point of the story that happened to me today. Sorry for any mistakes. I'm German, so English isn't my first language. Well, enough preamble. Let's go. The cast of my story, E.M., entitled Mom, E.S., Embarrassed Son, F.C., Friendly Cop, Me, well, have a wild guess. So this happened today at my local Burger King. I live in a small village and we don't have a Burger King, so I must drive to the next town if I want to eat there. Today's afternoon, I felt like going there, so I hopped in the car and got onto the Autobahn. A couple of minutes later, I leave the Autobahn and enter the parking lot of said Burger King. I leave my car, walk into the store, and place my order. After a short while, I get my food and leave the shop. I take the car key out of my pocket, walk towards my car, and press the unlock button. While I open the door and put my bag behind the driver's seat, EM enters the scene. As I put the seat back into the normal position to get ready to leave, she suddenly shows up behind me. EM. That's not your car. Who did you steal it from? Me. I'm sorry, ma'am. How can I help you? EM. That car does not belong to you. Who did you steal it from? Tell me so I can call the police. Me. Ma'am, this car is mine. I bought it myself with the money I earned at my job. EM. You're lying. You're not old enough to have a job where you get paid well enough to own a car like this. Actually, I don't even think you're old enough to drive a car. Me. Ma'am, I own this car and I'm 22. I have my license for more than four years now, so I'm very much allowed to drive a car. EM. No, you're not. You look like you're 16. I will call the cops on you. Me. Fine. Do it. They can come over and check. I own this car and I have a license. I got my license, saved my money, and bought the car when I had enough. I worked hard for it. EM. No, you haven't. Nobody your age has enough money for a car like this. My son is 18, so he's older than you are. He's working at the store. She points at the Burger King where I ordered my food. After school since he is 16 and hasn't got enough money to buy such a car. Why should you have it when you're younger than him? Me. Listen, lady, I've worked in IT since I was 18. I'm a trained IT specialist, and I work about 40 hours per week. I don't want to sound cocky, but I earn a little more money than someone who works part-time at a fast food place. EM. If you work 40 hours per week, then why are you here in the middle of the day? Me. Getting a little bit angry. Because I have vacations for Christ's sake, and I'm hungry, so I took my car to get some food. EM. This isn't your car. Stop lying. I bet you're an unemployed dropout who stole someone's fancy car. And now you're here to pose with it. I'm calling the cops right now. EM takes her phone out of her purse and starts to call the police. After she started the call, ES leaves the store through the front door and looks at me, standing in my open car door and his mom talking on the phone. ES, excuse me, that's my mom right there. Is everything all right? Is she calling someone for you? Me. Still angry AF. Not to be rude, but it's possible that your mom is a little retarded. She kept accusing me of stealing my car, and now she calls the police. EM. I'm not retarded, you little duck. Watch your language. ES. Looking at me. I'm sorry. She can be a little difficult sometimes. Looking at his mom. Thanks for picking me up, mom. Let's go. EM. No, we will wait for the police to arrive here. ES. Very calm. Mom, please relax. Let's just go home. I'm sure he owns this car and just wants to go home too. EM. No way. We will wait until the police get here to arrest this thief. ES looking at me. I'm sorry. Me. It's all right. It's not your fault. Let's just wait until the police arrive so your mom sees that I own this car. Fast forward a couple of minutes. A police car arrives in the parking lot. Two policemen leave the car, look around a little, and walks toward the three of us. FC. Hello. Did you report a car theft? EM. Yes, I did. It's this boy right here. Arrest him, officer. Me. Lady, I already told you. I own this car. FC to EM. Why do you think he stole this car? EM. He's way too young to even be allowed to drive a car. He can't own a car like this. FC to me. I'm sorry, sir, but can you show me your license and your car documents? Me. Sure. Wait a minute. I'll get them. 
I proceed to walk around the car to get my car documents out of the glove box. EM grabs me shouting, Officer, do something! He is clearly trying to run away! FC, ma'am, let him go. He's getting the documents I asked for. EM, no he isn't. He's clearly trying to avoid charges for car theft. FC, let him go, ma'am. EM lets go of me. I walk to the other side of my car, open the glove box, and hand the documents over to FC. I take out my wallet and hand over my license, too. FC checks them and says everything is all right here. Why did you call us? EM. No, the car is stolen. My son is older than him, and he can't afford a car, so this car is stolen. FC. Look, it's right here in these documents. This car belongs to Playmore 96. That name is also on his driver's license, so this car belongs to the young man. EM. I don't care. The documents and license are fake. Just do your job and arrest him, officer. FC. Look, man, I will ask my partner to run his license plate through the database, if that calms you, okay? EM. Yes, do it. You will see the car is stolen. The other cop walks over to the car and looks up my license plate. A couple of minutes later, he comes over and says, I looked up the license plate. The car is registered on Playmore 96, so it's his car. EM. No, he stole this car. She walks over to me, trying to take my car key. Me. What are you doing? What the hell is wrong with you, lady? EM. It's not your goddamn car. Give the key to me. I will find the real owner and give him his car back. FC. Ma'am, please stop this or we will have to arrest you. EM. You don't have to arrest me. I didn't steal this car. Why don't you do your goddamn job instead of being a ducking, useless officer? Arrest this boy. FC. Ma'am, I must ask you to calm down. Step away from Playmore 96, or we'll have to arrest you. E.S. Very calm. Come on, Mom. It's his car. He said it. The cops said it. Calm down and let's go home. Please, Mom. E.M. stops trying to steal my key and looks at her son. All right, honey. If you want to leave now, we'll leave. While walking towards her car, she shouts at me. I will get that car back to its owner. You little prick. I swear to God I will. EM and ES then proceed to enter their car and drive away. FC hands over my license and car documents. Sorry to bother you. Do you want to press charges against EM? Me. No. It's all right. I'm sorry you had to come out here to take care of this crappy situation. FC. That's okay. This isn't even anywhere near the worst situation I've experienced this week. Have a nice day. Me. Thanks. You too. FC. Thanks. Cops get back to their car, enter it, and leave. I finally get into my car, too, and leave the parking lot to drive home. Now I'm sitting here eating a cold Shelly cheeseburger and writing down this story. Knowing that EM's son works at this Burger King, I guess I'll never go there again. I don't want to spend half another afternoon arguing with EM and waiting for the cops. The last story is titled, Person Who Insisted on Buying House Says, Not Worth the Asking Price. Late 90s, my grandparents had left a house behind on Walnut Avenue in West Seattle. As much as I wanted to live there, it was to be sold and divided among surviving relatives. A state planner said the house would have been currently worth well over a million, will go for 350 k but might take some time. I knew the lady across the street wanted to buy the property and rent it out to keep builders from erecting a three-story unit that would block her view of Seattle. I knocked on her door and told her we were selling and asked if she was interested. She tried to lowball me at 250 k and I said, no thanks. Even if it took a while, we would get the full value. She told me to my face that I was stupid if I thought I was going to get that much. This pissed me off, as I knew the property alone with unobstructed Seattle view was worth a pretty penny. So I started knocking on a neighbor's door, letting them know the property was about to be listed, figuring someone would want another property on the same block. I sold the house to the fifth person that answered their door. Deal was done in a matter of days. I received a commission for the sale. The across-the-street neighbor who lowballed me called me up furious that I didn't give her a chance to match the price. I said, you told me I was stupid for asking that price, and that made me want to sell it to prove you wrong, then hung up. The next one is an entitled people story. I went to college in the mid-90s back when phones, if you had one, weren't smart, tablets weren't even dreamed of yet, and laptops, while in existence, weren't really attainable for us poor college kids. I, along with a decent chunk of my fellow dorm mates, didn't even have a desktop computer of my own yet. 
I'd made friends with a couple of guys who shared a room in my dorm, one of whom we'll call N, flipped back and forth between great and annoying as hell. The other we'll call R. He was the nicest, funniest guy ever, and a total tech geek, which meant he had an awesome computer. They pretty much had an open room policy. If one of them was home, the door was propped open, and everyone was welcome, mostly ends doing. At times, this drove R crazy, because while he was fine with an open room, he was not so cool with open computer. And just telling people to stay off it when he wasn't there wasn't working. I was one of a very select few who was allowed on R's computer when he wasn't present, probably because I used it for actual schoolwork instead of surfing porn sites and collecting malware. I also used words like please and thank you every once in a while. Anyway, one day R dropped by my room, which never happened. And said I needed to come down to his room right now. When we got to his room, R shut the door and explained that he was going to be out of town for a week. Some family issues, if I remember correctly. He knew I'd need to use the computer at some point and wanted to show me a new program he had installed. He had me sit down at the computer and indicated an icon for me to click. It was a slightly blurry, mostly naked lady titled Nudes. I told him I really didn't want to see those, but he said to trust him. When I clicked on the icon, the screen flashed to black and white for a second, then went back to normal color, and nothing. It did nothing after that. I looked at R in confusion. He smiled and told me to try clicking on some other icon. When I went to open something else, the icon ran away from my cursor. I'm not sure if he had written the program or downloaded it from somewhere, but it was hilarious. Once you started the program by clicking on the nudes icon, the program mimicked the screen until you tried to click on something else. Then it animated the desktop icons and made them all move away from your cursor. It was impossible to click on anything, and even restarting the computer didn't help. R had set the program to run automatically at startup. You had to use a very specific, seemingly random set of keystrokes to shut off the program. When R left for the week, he put a note on his computer saying that only I and one other person were allowed to use the computer while he was gone. I stopped by when he had been gone a little over 24 hours to do some typing. N told me I wouldn't be able to use the computer because he'd done something to it. He was completely freaked out that R was going to blow when he got back. I told him I'd look at it and messed around for a bit playing catch the icon until N was distracted. Then I miraculously fixed the issue, but didn't know what I had done, of course. I finished typing up my assignment while N yelled across the hall that they were all saved because the computer was fixed. I chuckled to myself as I shut down the computer before I went to leave. The next story is titled, Dealing with a Dodgy Competitor. So I work in the construction industry as a project manager and have recently had to deal with a competitor who would cut corners and do shady dealings to get contracts. He would do things like providing kickback to other managers, money exchanging hands, or use standover tactics to get what he wanted. You could go as far as saying he was an all-around bad egg. So earlier in the year, I had put in all the hard yards into designing a specification for a job and going through design meetings with a client. We lost the project at the last minute due to the shady tactics listed above. Now because of the work and the level of detail I had to put in prior to losing the contract, I knew there were certain items the client wouldn't budge on. One of these non-negotiables only came from one supplier in the world. Even though it was only worth a couple of cents per item, the client wouldn't budge on an alternative. So in my pettiness, I called the supplier and ordered all 15,000 of these they had in stock. I also called every other stockist on the website and managed to source a further 5,000, leaving no stock available until late December. So anyways, let's fast forward to this week. 
The job is close to hand over stage, and the competition has done the predictable thing and deviated due to the supply issue. The client came out to inspect and notices they have used an alternative product without approval and is deviated from the contractual agreement. This now has led to massive amounts of rectification work and them being hit with liquidated damage as the project will now not be delivered on time. Costing him close to 300k AUD, the competitor has now been removed from the approved contractors list within my industry and have been escorted from the facility to never return. Not knowing, I have 2,000 of this item stashed in my office, and it was me that caused the supply issue. The next story is titled, I don't care if you made the trails, it's still private property. So this happened a couple of years ago. I grew up in West Virginia, but I had a grandfather who lived in Pennsylvania. He lived in a pretty forested area with not a lot of neighbors and owned about 27 acres. We would visit my grandfather on most holidays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, etc. And I would always drive his four-wheeler around the trails in those woods. I knew those trails really well since I had grown up driving on them. So when my grandfather died, my mom inherited the house and all the land with it. We drove up there within a week to make sure the house was in good livable condition Still, as we had not been up there for about three years before, and my parents were planning on selling it, I decided I would take the old four-wheeler out into the trails to make sure they were clear of debris, so whoever would buy the house and could enjoy the trails like we had. Like I said before, I knew those trails really well, so when I came up to a trail that I had never seen before, I got a little suspicious and decided to go down it. Now my grandfather had had problems with hunters trespassing before, so his land was very clearly marked with no trespassing signs. Now after driving down the trail for a couple of minutes, I eventually came into this person's backyard. I decided I'd drive back to my grandfather's house to let my dad know of the random trail leading to this person's backyard and ask him what we should do about it. I got back to my grandfather's house and told my dad about the trail and he said he wanted to come back down with me to that house to inform them they were trespassing on private land. So my dad drove us back down on the four-wheeler to this trail leading to the house. But on the way there, we were still on my grandfather's property. We passed this maybe 13-year-old kid on an ATV. My dad waved him down and the kid stops. My dad shut off the four-wheeler and informed the kid that he was trespassing on private land. My dad waved him down and the kid stops. My dad shut off the four-wheeler and informed the kid that he was trespassing on private land. The kid and his snobby little voice said, But I made these trails, so I should have every right to drive on them. My dad said he still trespassed to make the trails, and just because he made them doesn't give him the right to trespass on our land. The kid replied back with, Well, I spent all summer on these trails and put a lot of hard work into them, so you should just let me drive on them anyway. My dad told him that he needed to leave right then or he was going to call the police. The kid then let out a long annoyed sigh and said, Whatever, and took off back towards his house. Later that day, my dad went down the trail to see where my grandfather's property ended and blocked it off with a rope and a very obvious no trespassing sign. We thought that was the end of it, but even later that day we got a knock on our door. It was the kid and his dad. MD is my dad. ED is entitled dad. ED, my son says you were trespassing on our land and kicked him off his trail. MD, actually your son was trespassing on our land and was very rude when I asked him to leave. ED, but my son made that trail. He has just as much right to be on them as you do. MD, actually, no, he doesn't. He trespassed to make that trail, and he has absolutely no rights to be on it. ED, but he spent all summer making them and worked really hard. Just let him go on the trails, or I'll call the police. MD, go ahead and call the police. It'll save me a phone call I have to make. 
Then, this entitled dad literally pulls out his cell phone and dials 911 to report people trespassing on his son's trail right in front of us. My dad, being the non-confrontational guy he is, he waits for the police to show up, which takes like 30 minutes because of how far out we are. The moment the police officer steps out of his car, this entitled dad starts yelling at them about how we trespassed on their trail and we should be arrested right then and there. Another officer steps out of the car and walks over to us and asks us what happened. We calmly explain to him the situation, and he goes back to talk with the other officer, who is still dealing with the screaming, entitled dad. After the officers calmed entitled dad down, they told him they need to leave and not come back or he would be arrested on trespassing charges. The dad is screaming at us and cussing us out the whole time, and his son are walking back to their truck. The dad gets in, starts the truck, and peels out of our driveway. My dad thanks the officers. They leave and we go inside. We never really had any more major problems like that with Entitled Dad and his son, except for them repeatedly ripping down the rope with the no trespassing sign on it. I almost hoped that the dad and kid would trespass again, so they would get arrested, but we never saw them on the land again. The next story is titled, Unwitting Pawn in Teacher Conflict. Some context. My high school graduating class was about 300 students, so it wasn't small, but it definitely wasn't huge. Many upper grade classes were offered only one section per year. For instance, if you were taking AP English, it was only the fourth period, and you were only one of 25 students taking it that year. AP equals advanced placement, which is or nearly so taught at the level of a freshman university course. Students in AP classes could take tests at the end of the year that could, if they scored high enough, be counted as university credit for those freshman level courses. Teachers who taught those classes would teach other classes as well. Frequently, they would round out their teaching assignment with lower grade classes. For example, the teacher who taught AP English would also teach two to three classes of freshman English, which every freshman had to take, every year as well. Needless to say, most seniors already had all their teachers in previous years. Whenever there was a test in AP English, about half of those students wouldn't be done when class was over. We had 50 minutes per class. No problem, the teacher, I'll call her Sharon because that's her name, is willing to let students stay late to finish up. And she writes hall passes for them to get to their next class, which the teacher of the next class has to honor. Well, for whatever reason, every year, the one AP English class would always occur right before the one AP Calculus class. Maybe some pettiness predated my story. I'm sure you can imagine how annoyed the calculus teacher, Jim, would be on English test days. Calculus class begins, teacher begins his lecture, and about 20% of the class shows up. Ten-ish minutes later, now Jim feels like he has to start over on the lecture. So his class time on these days is effectively shortened by Sharon letting students stay past the end of class. I was far better at math than English, and while I didn't hate Sharon, I got along with my math teacher, including Jim, much more than any other teachers in the school. After one of these English test days, Jim had enough of the BS. He asked me to see him before English class the next day. I show up the next day and he hands me a laptop computer and tells me to sit down and he has me do some type of busy work. English class starts while I'm sitting in Jim's classroom. Ten minutes go by. Twenty. Thirty. Forty. He tells me to get my stuff, writes me a hall pass, and then tells me to go to class. I show up with five minutes left, hand Sharon my hall pass. She looks at it and tells me to sit down, obviously annoyed by the situation. English test didn't run overtime anymore, although by this time it was nearly the end of the school year. So there weren't many more tests anyway. But wait, there's more. My brother is five grades younger than me. So this happened near the end of my brother's seventh grade year. His freshman year began a bit more than a year after I graduated. So fast forward to his freshman year. As I mentioned earlier, Sharon also taught freshman English. So my brother had her. He did not have a class with Jim that year. But on one occasion early in the school year, he had to deliver something to Jim's class in the passing period right before his English class. This delivery caused my brother to be late to English, only by a few minutes, but he showed up with a hall pass signed by Jim. 
He walked into class, handed Sharon the hall pass. She read it, glared at my brother, and said, never again, and told him to sit down. My brother at that point didn't know my story, but happened to relay this incident to me some time later. I nearly died laughing as I told him why Sharon's response to the hall pass had been so unnecessarily harsh. The last story is titled, Park in My Driveway? We'll see about that. Back when I was in high school, let's say about 1966 or 1967, my family lived not too far from Colorado Boulevard in Pasadena where the Rose Parade happens every January 1st. Huge crowds of people showed up, and parking could get congested. One January 1st, someone parked in our driveway. Didn't ask permission, just parked, locked, and left. Fortunately, in those days, car door locks could be opened with a straightened metal clothes hanger. One meter long heavy gauge wire with a hook on one end inserted between the frame and the window hooked around the lock push button and the button lifted. So we unlocked the car, pushed it into the middle of the street. Didn't remember having any difficulty with the steering wheel lock, so I guess the car didn't have one. Relocked it and went inside. Should mention that the street had two lanes each direction, plus turning lane in the center. The car was left in the turning lane. Car was towed. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you would like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.